Hello, and thank you to the organizers for having me. I've never been to one of these. It's great. Um, I've done some work on uh, carbonate compensation, and calcification plays a major role in it, as I hope to tell you. I did this work with Yiming Luo, uh, who's at Sun Yat-sen, and Jack Middleberg. Um, I have to tell you, I'm an unrepentant geologist. <laughs> if that induces an uncontrollable desire to run out of the room screaming, please do so now because it's rude later, okay? <laughs> okay, and I want to talk to you about things on short and long, particularly long, okay, time scales, and how uh, something like calcification, which is a, a process that occurs on very short time scales, has a massive effect, perhaps, okay, in the, what can, happens to the ocean. So what's carbonate compensation? I'm going to start with some things you should have learned in, um, in first year chemical oceanography, but I'm making comparisons. That's why we're going to do this. So it's the ability of the oceans to adjust their chemistry, their chem carbonate chemistry, and therefore the pH, okay, by either preserving or dissolving calcium carbonate. Um, the oceans are able to do this because they have a particular structure. Uh, the surface of the oceans is supersaturated, and down below, it's undersaturated, okay? So there's the potential for dissolving and preserving calcium carbonate in this sort of situation. And if you can move these things, you can change how much you're preserving and how much you're dissolving. Okay, the depth at which uh, the saturation uh, occurs, okay, in the oceans, okay, is known uh, for the mineral calcite is the cal calcite saturation depth. <laughs> it's not moving. Use the stick. Ah, there we go. Didn't seem to like it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to use that uh, saturation depth as one of the things I'm talking about uh, with time. And um, at the saturation depth, okay, above the saturation depth, calcium carbonate uh, accumulates uh, without change, okay, and then at the saturation depth, if you look in the sediments, you'll see less and less calcium carbonate because the intensity of dissolution increases with depth, okay? You get to a particular depth in the sediment. Uh, in the oceans, rather, and look in the sediments, and there's no more calcium carbonate. That's called the snow line. Okay? And that's an analogy to snow on the mountains. Okay? That's an old analogy from the literature. There's another depth called the compensation depth. And the compensation depth is the depth at which the rain of calcium carbonate from the surface is exactly balanced by the amount of the solution that's going on, okay? At steady state, compensation equals snow line, but only at steady state, okay? I'm going to talk about changes in saturation and compensation depths. So can we predict these things? Yes, we can, okay. Not everybody has adopted this. In fact, I don't know anybody who has, um, but <laughs> These are very simple formulas for these depths. This is the one for the saturation. And it has this term in it, which many people should recognize. It's the dissolved calcium multiplied by the dissolved carbonate divided by a KSP, solubility product. This one is at one atmosphere pressure. Okay, you calculate that quantity, you multiply it by a scaling, which is about 5,500 meters, and you get a very good representation of where the saturation depth is, okay? At least for the present oceans. Um, the CCD is a little more complicated. It has that same term in it, of reflecting the effects of where dissolution starts. And then it has this other term, two of the terms you already know. There's this, that's the rate constant, the apparent rate's constant for um, dissolution of calcium carbonate on the seafloor. And there is the important term I want to bring up. Come on, there we go. It's the rain of calcite to the bottom. 
And of course, the reign of calcite to the bottom is proportional in some way to the calcification rate. This is the link back between geology and biology. Okay. There we go. So, how much do these two depths change during an acidification event? So, let's put a simple model out there that shows what's going to happen to these things. In an acidification, that's approximately. Okay, I give up. Um, it's, it's going to uh, approximately that of the acidification that's going on today. So we're going to add CO2 like we're doing now. Um, this is going to, the carbonate ion is going to fall, okay, and we're going to get dissolution. And that dissolution is going to neutralize the acid we're at, uh, adding to the system. So this is the plot. Um, there are three lines in here. Uh, the orange dashed is the PCO2 in the atmosphere, okay? The yellow line is the saturation level and the depth, and the red line is the compensation depth. Acidification occurs in the oceans. You can see it right there. It's, there's a slight lag with the PCO2 in the atmosphere because you've got to convect the acid into the deep ocean, it takes about 300 years. Then, later on, the two depths go back to their normal position before the acidification event. They're slightly different, but not enough to talk about, okay? Um, and that's due to the neutralization, as I had said. Now, let me tell you about something new because everyone should have known that from their introductory courses, right? Okay. Let's go back to this formula. The way the, the results I showed you work is by varying this, okay? This changes because I'm acidifying the oceans, okay? People have neglected something very simple, at least until very recently. What if I change that? What if I change the calcification and therefore the rain rate of calcium carbonate to the oceans? And that's not something you should have learned in your courses, I don't think. Okay? So if we change that, if we decrease it, for example, that's going to rise immediately. No lag, nothing like that. It moves. All right. There's some possibilities here. So let's look at it. So we're going to look at a situation, okay, and from what I just told you, if I change the calcification rate and decrease it, then the CCD should rise, just like in chemical compensation. Right? So these two things are going to happen at the same time, but they should be different. So I'm going to look at loss of calcification. Now that's going to have another effect. If I stop calcifying, I'm going to stop removing alkalinity from the oceans. Alkalinity is supplied to the oceans by rivers all the time. Now I'm going to get rid of that to some extent. Not completely. I'm just going to get rid of some of it. Alkalinity will build up in the oceans. Over what time scale? This is where I go long. Okay? Thousands of years. Tens of thousands of years. That build up will counteract the CO2 in part two that's entering into the oceans, not just dissolution on the bottom. Because if I add alkalinity on this side, I force this reaction that way, and CO2 is forced out of the system. So let's go back to that model, and let's add this idea of biological compensation. That is to say we're going to change the, the um, calcification in the system. Now, how am I going to do that? Well, one thing we are going to have to realize right away is that we don't have a 
good functionality at the ecological level on how production of uh, cal uh, calcite bear uh, containing organisms changes with saturation. Kristen did a great job on telling us on what we think we might know about it right now, but on long time scales, we don't know this. So instead of trying to give you a formula, we're going to look at three cases, three end member cases, so to speak. The supply of calcium carbonate to the seafloor is going to mirror inversely the CO2 in the atmosphere. CO2 goes up, calcification goes down, according to some linear law, OK? We'll look at no recovery. So we start poisoning the calcifiers, and they stay that way. What this really means is that they're no longer um, ecologically superior to who's compete, who they're trying to compete against, and those organisms move in, okay? Permanently. And the other one where there's delayed recovery. We allow the organisms to, um, to die, but then they come back after a while. Okay, this is going, these are the results for a 25% decrease in calcification maximum. Uh, there is no um, extinction here. Nothing like extinction. This is the CCD only, not the saturation. So let's look at the compensation depth. The, red, the solid red line is the case of rapid recovery. So the CO2 and calcification are linked linearly. It goes up and it goes down. You can't tell the difference between that line and an ocean without biology, other than the production. But the line, the other two cases, there are dashed lines here, OK? At first, what they're ca they cause the CCD to go much higher. They, they cause the saturation depth actually to rise even more. That is interesting, but what's really interesting is what happens later. Because I've reduced the calcification rate over a long period of time, alkalinity is building up in the oceans. After a while, right here, the two types of scenarios, they diverge radically. Alkalinity keeps building up in the ocean because there's no biology to take it out. Well, there's only 75% of the biology to take it out. If it doesn't recover at all, the entire ocean is now above the CCD. The CCD's at the bottom. Every bit of the ocean now accumulates calcium carbonate. It gets almost as bad even with a delay. If they don't return, then alkalinity accumulates. That's very important. And we go from this to this. Um, Leonard Bach had a great term for this, OK? The white ocean, OK? We face the possibility of the white ocean. Has the white ocean ever occurred? OK, uh, I just want to note that that's called overdeepening. OK. Has it ever happened? There's a real possibility it has. During what the PTM, the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. Okay, that's a period of time in the past, 55 million years ago, when there was extra warming on a warm period. Uh, I'll tell you how warm it was 12 degrees C water, bottom water at the pole, the northern pole. That's warm. Okay. It was a period of high CO2, definitely about 1,500 parts per million. And the PTM had release of CO2 in it. Could have been as high as 2,000 ppm. 
we can go out and we can use uh, cores to get paleo records of that situation. Okay. I'm going to show you data from Wall of the Spay. This has been around for uh, 20 years now. Okay. Um, this is coring data, how much calcium carbonate there is. This is relative time. That's the PTM begin, so it's all relative to that. Uh, the time scale, it, it's you know, 50,000 years there. Okay. Uh, what you see as you're working, as you're accumulating sediments up to the PTM, it's about 85% calcium carbonate in the sediments. Then you hit the PTM and at every paleo depth that's been drilled, and there are only three, unfortunately, as you'll see, have been drilled, calcium carbonate goes to zero and then slowly builds back up again. They think the reason for this is the release of CO2 from the um, dissociation and then oxidation of methane hydrates. One thing you might want to notice is that while there's about 85% calcium carbonate in the sediment before, there's about 92% afterwards. The ocean's alkalinized and preserved more, or the calcification rate went up. So what I did with that data is to give you the same type of plot as before. I only have three data points, however. I can tell you when the CCD was at certain times. Okay? And so we model that. Okay? And there's a CCD. And if it was going to do what a non-biological uh, influence situation is, it would just do the, it would be sliding over here much more shallow. This data indicates that you're going to do something like this, which is an overshooting. And all the paleoceanographers who have studied this period say there's overshooting and therefore alkalization of the oceans. Most people attribute the alkalization not to a decrease in calcification, but to an increase in weathering. I model this by decreasing the calcification by 25%. So, I'm going to skip that one, unfortunately. There are two forms of carbonate compensation. One is chemical, which you're all used to, and one is biological, related to calcification. There may have been biological calcification to explain the overshooting into, into the PTM 55 million years ago. And if we look at the anthropogenic, uh, Anthropocene acidification, Depending on what calcification does, we may end up with, strangely enough, from an acidified ocean to an alkalinized ocean. And that's why it's so important for geologists to know what calcification does in acidification events. Okay? If we're going to predict what the future is like, we need to know. Thank you. So we do have some time for targeted questions. Whoa, there goes the hands again. Uh, and then we'll move to the panel in five minutes or so. All the time, so I'll ask this time. Uh, great talk, Bernie. Now my question is, you're so focused on that biological carbon in the flux, but can you just decrease carbon in the flux to deep sea while not changing organic carbon flux, if that two comes together? Uh, I agree with you, no. We just looked at the um, uh, inorganic carbon flux, the CA, CO3. That's the only thing we looked at. We didn't link it to well, organic matter production. Right, but if organic carbon is some way linked, then you have more uh, respiration in the sediment. I know. Right? Uh, I agree with you, OK? Uh, we just didn't do it in this particular study. Uh, thanks. Great talk. Uh, can you tell the difference? You, you, if I understood you correctly, you were suggesting, so we've heard talks today about 
coccolis producing calcium carbonate and raining into the deep sea versus corals, in your model, can you tell the difference between whether the coccolis stopped calcifying or the corals? Because the corals went extinct, right, during, during the PETM. So what if you just stop producing coral reefs? Can that account for what you're, you're talking you're, about? You're, you're right. Um, no, this is a deep sea model, and it's blaming everything on uh, phytoplankton. plankton, OK? But you're right. But there's a possibility that this was all due to a change in the interception of, of bicarbonate uh, at the uh, air uh, land water interface, basically. Um, we've, while I didn't take it into account here recently, working with a student of Apisleucis, we have looked, uh, we did the, um, uh, we modeled the average composition and uh, uh, carbonate chemistry of the Cenozoic Ocean. By getting the average, we saw that the, there were large uh, uh, deviations from that average. And some of those we've been able to link to changes in corals. Okay, so it's possible for them to have had an effect. I just suggested this as a possible mechanism, okay, not as an actual explanation, because there's still the burner weathering hypothesis on top of that, okay, challenging as another way of explaining it all. Oh, uh, hi, this is Brendan Carter from the University of Washington. Uh, I'm curious if the relationships that you showed uh, relating the uh, compensation depth to the flux, do you think that those relationships would need to be revised in the very different ocean that you described? If the ocean did what, sorry? Uh, in the very different ocean you described where there's a lot more alkalinity and maybe therefore a lot more uh, changing the relative fractions of uh, dissolved inorganic carbon and whatnot coming down into the deep ocean. Okay, um, I'm missing something there, uh, unfortunately. Are, are, you say, are you asking me if um, the relations I used would be accurate in the past oceans? Yeah, that's uh, okay. broadly the question. We used, uh, we used Pitzer equations to bring chemistry back into, like for example, uh, a, a change in magnesium ocean and things like that. That's embedded in there. So hopefully uh, the, the, the so-called constants are not constants in time. They are only constants for the particular ocean we have. Understood, thanks. Hi, Samantha said like, right over here at University <laughs> of Connecticut. Um, I uh, was wondering, uh, kind of related to what Brendan was asking, um, if the, in those equations that you used for Zs, for your various Zs, uh, your depths, um, if you found that, that, you know, that if that variable um, in the equation, the 5,500 kilometer depth, the reference depth, if that specifically was important to change in going back to the different oceans, um, well, or how sensitive your results would be used for something like that. That, that constant actually gets changed for different oceans and different temperatures. It, it's definitely dependent on surface temperature, bottom water temperature. Um, using paleo records of temperature, we can go back and use the Pitzer equations to actually get the, uh, the equivalent of those equations back into the past. That's how we do it. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hey, Bernie. Okay. Um, my question was uh, just regarding different time scales. So the PE, uh, my oh, it's not working. Okay. I think it, it's just oh, really low. It is. <laughs> okay. um, uh, the current rate of, of chemistry changes is much, much faster than the PETM. I wonder if you could speculate on how that might influence <laughs> some sort of um, it, it's, it's a lot harder on the biology, that's for sure. Um, during the PTM, if you notice the scales, um, things the introduction of CO2 during the PTM was on the order of about, mm, uh, up to about 5,000 years, okay? We're doing it in three and 400 years. Uh, that could have huge effects on, you know, the calcification rate. Um, uh, there's no extinctions during the PTM, okay? So it was slow enough for biology to adapt to it to some extent, even though the species changed going on, the total amount of calcium carbonate uh, being produced didn't change that much, okay? That's why I limited it to 25, 25%. We've run simulations with 50% and, and 75% losses 
of, uh, of calcification. And the results are frightening. Uh, the oceans really uh, alkalinize strongly if it doesn't come back. 